Cutluck Ataman's 1999 film Lola and Billy the Kid depicts life in the queer Turkish community of Berlin through the tragic story of Lola, a Turkish German drag queen. The multiple identities of the characters in the film collide and interact in terms of race, gender, sexuality, culture and class. The film is often referred to as being part of Turkish German cinema, yet it doesn't fully fit the usual understanding of this mould. Its Turkish director and writer had no connection to Germany prior to writing the film, but the cast is mainly Turkish German and the film's language is a mixture between the two. Even the film's genre is hard to pin down, part Turkish melodrama, part Berliner cabaret, part American Western. Almost straight away, the film reflects concepts of hybridism an intersectional identity. This video essay will specifically deal with the way Berlin spaces reflect and demonstrate these intersections, and in turn the ways in which Berlin itself is queered. Ataman originally planned the movie for his native Istanbul, yet due to production and financial difficulties, ended up setting his film in the gay subcultural underworld of Berlin. But why Berlin? Ataman points to the various divisions and contradictions within the film and notes that Berlin was deliberately chosen to reflect this, saying, Berlin is a city of different realities, like in Istanbul, where you have the division of east and west and the river breaking the city into two. Indeed, Berlin's complicated and divided history offers a unique lens through which to view the intersectional dimensions of the film. Ataman views the film on a double axis, East meets West, Underworld meets Upperworld. The idea of East meets West has a double meaning in this sense, East and West Berlin, but also the minority Eastern Turkish culture versus dominant Western German culture. This hybridism can be expanded from its setting across the film and all its characters, straight meets queer, masculine meets feminine, past meets present, which all converge in Berlin. This city becomes a space of literal and figurative crossing points, which emulate and involve queer experience. It has a long-standing queer history, which was historically at its most vibrant during the Weimar period, home to gay bars and clubs, and birthplace of queer cinema, with the world's first pro-gay film, Anders als der Anderen, featuring renowned sex doctor Magnus Hirschfeld. This queerness stands in stark contrast to the viciously homophobic and racist Nazi regime that followed, imprinting Berlin's lasting topography of terror. Then comes the city's division, not only geographically by its river, but for 40 years politically by the Berlin Wall. As Corinne Hamazani notes, it is one of history's ironies that Coming Out, one of the GDR's only gay feature films, premiered on the very same day the Berlin Wall opened and allowed for the first time since 1961 masses of jubilant East Berliners to come out of their enclosed existence and cross into the West with impunity. Finally, and crucially within this film, is the element of ethnic and cultural mixing. Berlin is home to a large immigrant population, especially of the Turkish diaspora. The influx of Turkish gastarbeiter since the 1950s into West Berlin has led to Berlin being labelled the biggest Turkish city outside Turkey. However, many Turkish German people living in Berlin face racism and xenophobia. And this film was partly inspired by an epidemic of xenophobic violence by neo-Nazis in the 1990s. The opening scene firmly orients this as a Berlin film, as the camera pans across the Siegelsäule. Built to celebrate Prussian war victories surrounding German unification and relocated by the Nazis in 1939, this iconic monument has a complex history rooted in German militarism and masculinity, yet is represented by a female figurehead, the Roman goddess Victoria. As the scene continues, the camera switches to Marat as he walks through the tear garden, yet from a high angle, looking down on him as if the audience is Victoria herself. The camera swings round to show Marat's face for the first time, the out of focus golden figure looming over his shoulder. Tiergarten is a notorious spot for gay cruising, and it quickly becomes clear what Murat is doing there. This allows the audience to make the contrast between illicit hookups and the park's opulent imperial past, straight away introducing the idea of underworld meeting the upper world. 
we don't see the Ziga Soila again until the very end of the film. Unlike the dark, eerie opening where the column hovers out of focus as a threatening, omniscient presence and reminder of historical German violence, this time it is a wide-angle image of triumph. Calypso and Sherazade driving off into the sunset in full drag with the promise of a bright future paid for by Friedrich's mother's brooch. The meaning here made even more striking, as as Andrew Weber points out, this is a Turkish inheritance of old German money. The use of contrasting lighting in these shots also portrays the situation of the characters. Murat's nervous insecurity in his homosexuality, in comparison to the two drag queens' open celebration of their identities, wearing women's clothing in broad daylight and flirting with the taxi driver. Weber points to this reclamation of the city space as a queered reimagination of a phallic emblem of masculine power. The queering of this phallic monument is nothing new. After all, Ziegersäule is the name of Berlin's major monthly gay magazine. The mixture of male and female in this monument also comes into play, showing the deconstruction of gender. The phallic imagery of the monument is ultimately undermined by the female representation of victory. This is reflected in the film's final line when Sherazade remarks in Turkish, I'm a woman with balls, don't say I never told you, which also shows the deconstruction of nationality. The wide angle final shot overlooked Siebsinton Unistrasse, a site of major political protests in 1953 against the oppressive Soviet regime, highlighting this ending as an act of political protest by our queer Turkish characters. Sitzend in Unistrasse leads to the Große Stern, the enormous roundabout on which the Siegertsäule stands, and the point at which the biggest roads in the city converge. It is only fitting that the film ends on Berlin's largest intersection. The film subplot focuses on the burgeoning romance between aristocratic Friedrich von Secht and Turkish renboy Xender. Ataman presents three different home spaces, Friedrich's Vermilionsitz in opulent Wahnsee, with its connotations of imperial riches and Nazi oppression, his plain East Berlin apartment with its attached socialist history, and the flats in which the Turkish characters live in vibrant and bustling yet impoverished districts of Kreuzberg and Neukölln. One particularly interesting scene to explore is at Friedrich's mother's house in Wannsee. The two men embrace passionately, falling backwards onto Friedrich's model of Berlin. As an architect, he is presumably part of rebuilding the reunified Berlin, showing how the city is envisaged and set out by its rich white planners. Yet the characters fall on top of it, toppling the phallic fernseher to him in a display of the ways in which queer and foreign bodies navigate and literally deconstruct the city space. This scene works in a similar way to Judith Butler's reading of Paris is Burning, showing the simultaneous production and subjugation of subjects in a culture which appears to arrange always and in every way for the annihilation of queers, but which nevertheless produces occasional spaces in which those annihilating norms, those killing ideals of gender and race, are mimed, reworked, resignified. The imbus at Hermannplatz is also a recognisable feature of the film. Taking place on another intersection, the one between Hermannplatz, Urbanstrasse and Sonnenallee in Diebus Neukölln, Hermannplatz is a site of social and cultural mixing. Neukölln is home to a high proportion of immigrants and well known for being a multi-culti area or melting pot where many different cultural backgrounds merge. In particular, the area has a large Turkish population. However, alongside its strong Turkish influences, Neukölln is also home to a number of gay pickup sites. Volkspark Hasenheide is another popular gay cruising spot and Hermannplatz is a known site for clapping sex, or cottaging, where gay men and prostitutes use public bathrooms for sex. This is shown in the film as a smartly dressed white businessman approaches the imbus where Murat and Billy have just met. Billy instructs Murat on what to do, and Murat follows the businessman down the steps to the men's toilets, a very literal enactment of entering Berlin's sleazy underworld. This is a place where the different layers of society collide, Yet what is particularly noticeable is the white businessman entering this working class immigrant district. His whiteness and richness allow him to escape the stigma of his homosexuality amongst his peers as he travels to a different part of the city to seek out gay sex, whereas the Turkish characters live and work in the same spaces, 
lacking the privilege which would allow them to escape the homophobia, not only within wider German society, but within their own community. As Jennifer Petson describes, they must learn to develop strategies and tactics for negotiating this unremitting normalization of homophobia when moving through an occupying space as they face increased marginalization. The final scene I'm going to talk about is the discovery of Lola's body in the River Spree. This scene opens with a typical Berlin image, the u trundling across the Orbebahnbrücke before the camera pans down to reveal Lola, floating face up in the water still resplendent in a bright red wig and smudged makeup. A little girl has spotted her from the bank and repeatedly asks, <laughs> linking Lola's tragic figure to another liminal figure, the mermaid, half woman, half fish. The Orbebahnbrücke again evokes the idea of intersections as it was the site of a major historical border crossing between East and West Berlin. Christopher Clark interprets this image as a possible critique of a unified Berlin, due to the effect unification had on Berlin's minority ethnic groups, as the previously largely homogenous East German society struggled to accept West Berlin's immigrant population, and the number of xenophobic attacks rocketed in the 90s. To push this idea further, consider the dynamism of the frame. The U-Bahn train moving across the screen, quite literally leaving Lola behind as the camera pans downwards, alongside Ataman's attraction to Berlin based on its division by a river and opportunity of a double axis. Lola, and in the end Billy, end up in the spree, unable to navigate the intersectionality of their identities. After all, they not only face stigma for their relationship due to their gender and sexual identities, but also for their race making them a target of violence and abuse from neo-Nazi Germans, as well as their own friends and family.